स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग सो वील बी टॉकिंग अबाउट कैनोनिकल टेक्स्ट the godfather as the uh, one so we have been uh, discussing citizen kane as a canon and now we will talk about the godfather and what makes uh, the godfather such a big canonical text now uh, i'll just recap i'll just repeat what we have been talking because it has been quite a while since our last class so how are canons formed uh, one of you already gave a very good response to it that canons adhere to a certain set of standards uh, cinematic brilliance commercial success but not always okay there has to be some magic combination you know there is a term called je ne sais quoi it's a french term which i don't know i can't exactly uh, point my finger at them but there is a mysterious enigmatic quality about this text okay and we are basically talking about cinematic text so we are not literature so let's confine our conversation to cinematic text now etymologically that is the root uh, uh, of this word canon is derived from the ancient greek word and uh, i am not giving you the greek word but i'll give you the meaning and it means measuring rod that itself should tell you the, you know there is a standard there is a, a, a ben benchmark sort of measuring rod against which other works are measured or set against in literature those texts or in cinema those texts which are worthy of academic study okay so this is something we should remember and membership to canons ideally is fixed for a long time but is not necessarily permanent ranks are always fluid and entries are strict but uh, uh, extremely fluid there may be Uh, a canonical text which may exist on that list for 20 years and then one day it may find it um, find itself out of that text so there is every possibility to there is no guarantee that once a canon always a canon but there are certain texts and certain cinematic texts which have uh, their places assured and citizen kane and the godfather are two such films so um canons comprise uh, and i'm quoting in matthew arnold uh, 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 in the words of matthew arnold the great british critic and poet the best that has been thought and said in the world so the best of all and who defines this best uh, we'll look at that so canon in other words is high culture cinema may be popular culture but canon is still is if it belong a movie belongs to a canon it is high culture fellini's works ingmar bergman's works they are not low culture they are not low bro right do we agree to that okay so bergman fellini bartolucci they are definitely works of art okay cinematic canons now literary canons are formed uh and they have a certain standard there are certain parameters uh, for example if you give um, award a book with a booker or a pulitzer or a nobel okay there is a canon there okay the writer belongs to a to that elitist set how are cinematic canons formed of course award bodies you have been uh, recognized by palm d'or or bafta or academy so you are part of a canon yes there are flukes also but let's not think of flukes uh canons are formed by influential critics also and we have seen kaya du cinema and its critics andre bezon and even those uh, directors uh, directors who were critics for example chabrol and trufa who were eminent critics and rusaris who is the, the american cousin of these french uh, critics Pollen Keel. Uh, many people credit Pollen Keel of America uh, for raising the art of reviewing to the level of art, to the practice of re uh, reviewing to the level of art. 
previously reviewing was just a very general kind of a job where people would most often talk about the heroines dresses and the heroes hair and the makeup and sets example all those superficial things in india much of our uh, film criticism is centered on these things film is good tell me why okay film is boring why did you get bored so now there is uh, a some kind of awareness about uh, film review but uh, there was a time when for a very long time people would just take out their personal grudges on the director or on the actor you don't like x y z and you would trash his film regardless of its quality there was there were some directors about whom many of the critics were extremely prejudiced so they, this is a director who will who has who has made a good who has made a movie any movie it will invariably get a great review that's how film criticism was done in our country for a very long time of course i'm not saying that pauline keel was entirely unprejudiced if you read a biographies of her you will find that her work too was extremely jaundiced in favor of certain filmmakers for example she was always extremely favorable towards robert altman okay martin scorsese okay so there were certain people who she just whatever they would make she would praise them to the skies but pauline keel is still defined standard um film scholars for example you have david thompson uh, have you heard of david thompson you must you know uh, if you go to the us library for example and vijay i am talking to you go to us library and there is a history of american cinema by david thompson okay please go through it david bordwell is another eminent film scholar um david thompson is basically a historian film historian and he has written a phenomenal book called have you seen very accessible it's not a review uh, it's not a collection of reviews but a very personal take on 1000 great movies uh, of all times in all languages so extremely erudite work but very very personal very subjective phenomenal reading okay extremely well written roger ebert okay uh, writer and uh, roger ebert of course a great movies volume 1 and 2 and then you think of critics writers of sight sight and sound magazine for example and uh, they also form canons then who form who are the other uh, people or bodies that can form a canon organizations like um, afi what is afi american film institute and british film institute bfi so these are the bodies that canonize works of cinema so canonization doesn't just happen because you and i or some random blogger starts liking a movie okay and then they give some you know like a teenage writing in the middle of the night my list of top 10 fight club number 1 okay <laughs> better than the godfather or citizen kane okay and second movie i liked this actress a lot monica bellucci always figures you know, or some such nonsense so you know those are the top 10 films okay so uh, things like that okay but canons are, are a very serious study a very serious effort and they have to be respected of course as i was telling you previously also canons are not infallible canons can be prejudiced people have uh, criticized the formation of canons of course it's there but uh, uh, by and large we do go by the canon and now otherwise it will become all a very random study so now coming to the godfather why godfather is such a canonical text now this is the back story mario puzo wrote the draft of a movie called the mafia of course he had already written the godfather okay and there is only one godfather and not godfather 1 and 2 i am talking about those days in the early 70s so um uh, he had written, uh, he had gone to paramount pictures with a draft of a screenplay called the mafia and he uh, submitted it to robert evans he was the head the chief executive of paramount pictures robert evans turned it down okay robert evans 
who was once married to the beautiful uh, Ellie McGraw. Ellie McGraw, does she mean anything to you? She is the star of love story, okay? one of the soppiest and most sentimental movies of all time, <laughs> love story. But she was a raving beauty and uh, Robert Evans was once married. So, uh, that is not his only claim to fame. He was also a very formidable executive of Paramount <laughs> Pictures and he could not see any merit in the mafia. Uh, he said that uh, um, uh, there was a movie called The Brotherhood, recently then recently released with Kirk Douglas, Michael Douglas's father. Uh, it had recently bombed and it was another gangster picture and uh, he felt that the gangster genre had outlived its life. Okay, no, no people are no longer interested in this kind of cinema. Okay. However, the book remained on top of the charts for so long and there was a clamor to buy it and to buy the rights and Mario Puzo was extremely keen that Paramount produce it for him. So, uh, Robert Evans felt that perhaps there may be some sense in making this movie because the novel is such a huge success, so why not. And uh, he bought the rights of uh, The Godfather, he bought, uh, he commissioned uh, Mario Puzo to come up with a more refined version of the screenplay. However, the problem was in finding the right director. Peter Bogdanovich, high from the success of the last picture show, yeah, he refused it. And we will see why they refused. Sergio Leone was another great director who, refused, who turned it down. They did not want to make it. Uh, <coughs> Evans felt that he had his misgivings about Coppola. Okay, Coppola did not have a great success record. So, uh, do you know of any other works by Coppola before The Godfather? After Godfather, I know you will mention Apocalypse now. Before God, The Godfather, what had he made? Paleri, Rehan, the film Malas in this class. <laughs> what had he done? He was um, a very well respected filmmaker who was not extremely successful. And we will look at some of his films. What were those films? I am sure that. Uh, None of you, those titles you have ever heard of before this class. Okay. So, now Evans felt that anyway Coppola is a good choice, although he does not have any success ratio, because he is a guy who could smell the spaghetti. That means, Italian flavor of the novel. Coppola is the only one, a true blue Italian who can capture the essence of the novel. Francis Ford Coppola born in 1939 and prior to the godfather he had made three films you are a big boy now 1967 finian's rainbow with fred astaire which was a musical and rain people in 1969 which was a road movie and all commercial disasters but his work was appreciated it was felt that generally this guy knows his craft. So, that was his reputation. He had studied at a UCLA film school and the influence was there. Unlike Martin Scorsese who had gone to famously, see all these new wave Hollywood filmmakers, they had gone to and there were only two major film schools those days, UCLA or NYU. Okay. So, Scorsese etcetera, they come from NYU. Okay, so therefore, when you watch their movies, you feel the New York essence, the New York flavor. Hmm? Coppola, Los Angeles, okay. uh, but he, there was a reputation in, st in spite of his commercial disasters, he had won an Oscar for the screenplay of Patton. Patton is a war movie starring George C. Scott, okay. it is a very well known war movie. Uh, in 1970, he had won the Academy for the best screenplay. Okay, so he knew that guy knew how to write uh, uh, the story, the screenplay, and he knew how to direct a movie. So people were, but Coppola himself was not interested in taking up the Godfather script. And why? Because like all new Hollywood directors, he felt that he should be an author 
and you remember an author is a person who is in complete control of his product. Remember that he should be allowed to choose his own material, his own team and he should have complete control in other words, especially on the writing of the film. And they did not believe the, these new Hollywood, new wave Hollywood directors did not believe in adapting material, okay, because they felt Fellini did not do it, Bertolucci did not do it, Godard and Trufa do not do it, why should we, we are their disciples, we come from their school, okay, so we do not have to. But uh, he considered himself an artist, he said I was into new wave and Fellini and therefore I did not want to do this, but at the same time his dream was to establish a facility studio, an alternative studio called Zootrop. Have you heard of that? Okay. Zootrop pictures, that is Coppola's own studio, Zootrop movies. Okay. Coppola's father, I am just giving you, his mother was an actor, a performance artist. Coppola's father was a flutist. He also did a bit part in The Godfather first and uh, if you watch New York stories, which is an anthology film, I keep on talking about New York stories, Woody Allen, Scorsese and Coppola. So, in, in that anthology, Coppola's contribution is a segment called Life Without Zoe, okay, where the father of the family is a flutist. So, Coppola makes what I am trying to tell you. In immensely intensely personal films. He calls himself, it is he called The Godfather the greatest home movie ever made. It has his sister who, who is uh, Coppola's sister, which part did she play in, in the movie? Well, Diane Keaton cannot be his sister, right? Yeah, Connie, Talaya Shar. Okay, who later became Rocky Balboa's wife. Okay, so she, Talashar is Coppola's sister. His uh, his father Carmen did a bit part. Sophie Coppola is the kid who gets baptized in the movie. So it's a home movie, right? <laughs> uh, one of the gangsters. <laughs> yeah, but not a very major part. Okay, this is Zootrop, you know, I am just digressing, but Zootrop is actually a, a, a cinematographic instrument which produces the illusion of motion from the rapid suc succession of static pictures. This is what it looks like and Truffaut in 400 blows pays homage to Zootrop. He, he wanted to develop this technique and there is a scene where the little boy goes, you remember that? Okay. Did we do 400 blows with you? and it starts rotating, that is a uh, true false homage to uh, Zootrop instrument. Now, Coppola's recurring motifs, I am just uh, assuming that all of you have watched the first and second Godfather, but uh, let me just revise and then I will ask you something, I uh, ask you to do an activity. So, recurring motifs in Coppola individual's conflict with himself as well as with the society he lives in. Think the godfather, conflict is as much internal as external. We have been talking about conflict as a plot device, right? Apocalypse now, extremely internal. The conversation, all his subsequent films, if you watch them carefully, you will find a recurring motive. Questions of guilt, responsibility, loyalty, that is very important. Loyal to whom? Okay, so, that is a recurring question. Moral ambiguity, we will talk about it. All his characters are in shades of grey. Another import of the new wave influence, because uh, uh, before that it was all good and evil. Now, this is very important. In Coppola, we find celebrations and traditions and rituals. Um, watch the movie, there are two weddings on screen. Of course, there are several weddings, but the, on screen we actually get to watch two weddings. What are those? Which are those? Connie's wedding and 
Miley's wedding to who? Apollyon. Apollyon. Okay, good. Then uh, um, there are uh, deaths. Okay, so Apollyon dies, Sunny dies. Okay, they all, yeah. So that is another ritual. Godfather's funeral. There is a funeral. Childbirth and baptism. And everything is celebrated, ritualized. So we feel as if we are a part of this particular family. So recurring motive. Now, fame, reason for fame. First reason is the family, Corleone clan. The Godfather is epic in scope. It is a huge movie, not just in terms of length, but uh, uh, the scope itself is so much huge. You know, it, it covers births, deaths, rituals, weddings, and everything. Uh, it is in the tradition of films like Gone with the Wind, Ten Commandments, unfolds like a Greek tragedy. You look at its, its structure, very linear, I am talking about the first part, extremely linear, <coughs> almost built like a Greek tragedy and leading to denouement. There is an exposition, fine, there is a climax, there is a denouement, final catastrophe. One reason for its popularity is nostalgic yearning for a not so distant past, but that something that can never be retrieved. Then again, uh, a very universal element of ideas of families coming together. All of us have families. We do recognize the importance of family traditions and rituals and importance of celebrating things together. So, here we have people dining together, celebrating together, mourning together and we identify with the clan. Again, the emotions are very universal, greed, betrayal, thirst for revenge and how power passes from one generation to another right before our eyes, right. So, that is what I meant by Greek tragedy, Greek construction, okay. It is always a conflict between or a face off between father and son. We have done literature, some of you are aware of Oedipus. Hmm? So, the son always takes over from the father. Any questions here? I have been talking too much too long. So, any questions, any comments here? Okay. Universal wisdom, movies full of universal wisdom. Godfather tells his son Michael, the man who comes to you to set up a meeting, that is the traitor. <laughs> okay, and very true people who try to mediate, they are the ones who most often <laughs> plunge the knife into you. Okay. Um, like most blockbusters, it was all things to all people. The other day, we were talking about Casablanca, right? intertextuality. Casablanca is not one movie, but several movies. Who said that? Did Rolaba said that? Or did Umberto Echo said that? Good. Okay. Good. You remember that. Amber to Echo told us, Casablanca is not one movie, but several movies. Likewise, if there is a formula, this is the formula that blockbusters mean several things to several people. There is something for everyone. And watch a blockbuster. Citizen Kane is a canon for another reason. Right? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, it becomes a canonical text for what reasons? Reasons which are quite different from the Godfather. Changed. Techniques, yeah, his audacity, okay, and uh, uh, complete doing away with the conventional narrative structure. Here, Coppola actually doesn't do that. He tries some innovation, some techniques, some new techniques, but he doesn't do away with universal emotions. Okay, therefore, Godfather will always remain remain a greater hit. Three Idiots, I am told, is the biggest hit ever made in India. It has surpassed all other records, DDLJ, Shole, etcetera, Three Idiots. Do you think Shole is not just one movie, but several movies? Do we agree to that? It is not just a vendetta movie. Shole is many things to many people. There is something for everyone. Do we agree to that or not? Even if you do not have the stomach for violence, the gross violence, still you can watch Shole. 
do we agree to that okay if you don't like uh, violence skip those parts and watch basanti okay or the jailer okay if you are the sentimental kind you can watch sanjeev kumar <laughs> as many times as possible if you are uh, you know the more heroic adventurous kind jay and viru are there for you so it's several stories several things for several people that's one hallmark of a great commercial success a blockbuster okay uh, kapola for the first time and this is a, uh, he achieved a feat of creating heroes out of gangsters before that yes we had public enemies i am not talking our favorite depths movie <laughs> i am talking about james cagney version there were uh, there was a scarface okay but they all die a do dog's face, uh, death on screen okay so they were not canonized heroes on screen they were still gangsters who had to meet a terrible death here the godfather doesn't meet a terrible death his power continues his dynasty continues okay he coppola creates heroes out of gangsters don corleone for all his faults is still the moral center of the film why do we call him moral he has a code to be he has a code of conduct which is never violated no drugs and no drugs okay yes he is so family and family honor before everything so that's another very recognizable trope okay and something that uh, contributes towards making God, the godfather such a big blockbuster such an important canon of course there have been imitators but no one did it better than him so family honor and family before everything else john cazale brando james can and of course al pacino who uh, can you uh, comment on the dressing now vijay my question is to you the dress the way these men are dressed uh, yeah they are all uh, they follow a certain fashion which is uh, which shows class and elitism yeah and uh, the hat also shows a little a certain english influence to it okay uh, to be a gentleman okay the and bow ties the bow ties mm -hmm. and uh, even the police costume has a uh, well that's al pacino now i uh, my question yeah so she says there are three men who are almost dressed alike if you have watched the movie you will know so uh, my question now is to you sandeep al pacino stands out by way of dressing okay so what is he playing in the movie uh, he is returned from the war he has returned from the war okay and why does he stand out even in terms of clothes because he is an outsider in that family yeah he is the boy who is not supposed to be uh, inducted in the family business remember he is the boy who is not supposed to become one with the family he is a part of the family but the godfather never wanted him to take over the mantle okay sunny is the boy therefore he stands out initially even by the way he is dressed he is a war hero he has come back today and he is participating in his sister's wedding other men of this family are all dressed alike because they are one but michael corleone is different we are told that from the beginning so pay attention to clothes Okay, clothes tell you a lot of things. The way the Godfather is dressed throughout the movie, especially at the beginning of the story, and the way uh, he is dressed when he dies amidst tomato gardens. Okay, there is a difference because now he is more a retired. He is leading a retired life, and you will see Michael Corleone how he changes, how the way he uh, dresses up changes. Now he. is in his army regalia right now military regalia later on when he is just dating k he is dressed something uh, in a very different style you know one of those upper class uh, boys but by the end when he assumes the mantle he starts dressing up like his father pay attention to these little elements the movie also got oscars for its costumes memorable lines of course no one can forget i'll make him an offer that he can i mean these dialogues have come to become a part of our everyday conversation one reason for fame chole 
dialogues are still remembered. DDLJ, people remember the dialogues. Yeah. Therefore, all great movies you know, think the uh, think on with the wind. Frankly, my dear, as God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. Yeah. Tomorrow is another day. Scarlet O'Hara, memorable lines which we remember even today. Here is looking at your kid. Yeah. Play it again, Sam. So memorable lines. Say hello to my little friend. Which movie? Scarface. See? Okay. I believe in America, and that's the way the movie begins. American dream. Okay? And subversion of the great American dream. Godfather is a great subversion of the big American dream. That's my family, K, not me. Who says that? Michael. Reference to context, yes. Michael. And when does he say that? At the wedding. At the wedding when he is still the innocent, the outsider. And what happens at the end of the movie? Closes the door on her face. By the end of the second godfather, he, she is kicked out. Okay. He is very much his family, much more sinister than his brother and his father. Don't ever take sides against the family. Who says that? Michael and the God. Michael again. Good. You know the movie. Claim to fame, another reason, and this is a recurring motif in most blockbusters. The women's pictures don't make that much money. They may be artistically uh, acclaimed, okay, but movies that thrive on masculine quotes, okay, they always make it big. Now, so Godfather is, no, is nothing if not a monument to the world of authoritarian patriarchy. Men make all the decisions. You don't even know what Mrs. Godfather is called. Okay? She is never a part of the business. She is always in sunlight or in the kitchen or in the dining room. Never a part of the those closet rooms where Godfather conducts his business. Okay? You will never find women the uh, Godfather shuts K out. The second Godfather. The movie. who is the Godfather in the movie? Okay, and who is the hero of the film? Brando or Pacino? Al Pacino. And why do you call Al Pacino the hero? Give me one reason. He gets the girl. Okay. <laughs> what else? It's his progress. It's his journey. Good. It's his journey, his progress, his um, what to say, his point of view. So we are. Through the, uh, we are uh, we are taken through the story with him, along with him. Okay, we sympathize with him because we know he's just a sweet little boy like Ranjit, and now he has turned into something else. Okay, so it's, when he began, he was a very sweet innocent boy, and now he's something else. Okay, so we don't condemn him, we don't judge him. Okay, we sympathize him with him because we know the circumstances which turn him into what. He finally becomes. So he is the hero. Okay. Connie's unfortunate husband. He is always a hanger on. He wants to be included, but he's just thrown a bone that you get a living from our but you are not part of our family because after all you are a damad of the family, you know, you are nothing more than you are not our blood, and you will never. So never take sides against the family. Although he is a son in law, brother in law, but not the son or the brother, okay. you are always out. Even Tom Hagen is never taken into confidence when it comes to the most serious things. So, loyalty to the family and Michael does not even trust uh, uh, Tom Hagen that is played so brilliantly by Robert Duvall, when he decides to assassinate the uh, heads of the rival gangs, he is never told. Memorable line, and when I watched the movie first time, uh, that must have been some 20, 22 years ago, and I uh, could never forget, could never get over actually Luca Brasi's famous lines Godfather, I hope that uh, uh, their first child be a masculine child. Okay, he is invited to the wedding of uh, Godfather's daughter, Connie, okay, and he is honored that he has been invited. He is the trusted, loyal bodyguard. And I hope the first child is a masculine child. 
it matters a lot in a patriarchal system. Okay. Godfather to Johnny Fontana, okay. a man who does not spend time with his family can never be a real man. Johnny Fontana is that miserable singer, yeah. And uh, this is Callo, uh, uh, when uh, Michael cites Apollyana first time, in Sicily women are more dangerous than shotguns, go figure, whatever it means. <laughs> okay. Respect, I, I do not know what I have done to earn your disrespect, he tells it to the guy who comes asking for help. Okay, so, you have to respect me, respect is extremely important. Now, I am giving you an activity, take a break, 2-3 minutes, discuss it amongst yourself, give me a list of the great scenes. I am assuming you know the movie, even if you did not watch it last weekend, I am just assuming you know something about the movie. Make a list of the great scenes. Okay, time up. You two at the back. Yes. Shh, shh. I like to see when K. K. Khan comes back to Gandhi about Kali's husband's murder, and he says, "No, I didn't." I didn't do it. Yeah. And after that, when she still watches him, and then two people who come in and pay his respects to his daughter, I like that scene. You like that scene? His transformation. Good. I want you two. Yes. Uh, uh, Rehan and friend. Rehan, yes. Uh, uh, one plus uh, Mitchell Conley and Robert De, De Niro murdering uh, in uh, little little little. But sepia color. Yes. That's one. Then Connie's husband uh, murdered and uh, Mike Michael Conley strangled. Yeah. Yes. And uh, then the baptism scene. Yeah, the baptism mass massacre. Yes. And uh, when Michael says, "I would never uh, make my sister a widow," and the very next scene he kills him. That is very ironical, that is his transformation, what he has become now, yes, you guys. Uh, the scene where the film executive wakes up with his prized horse, Khartoum's head. In the My favorite scene, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, anything else? There is a hospital scene where… Uh, he wheels him out, <laughs> yes, do, do you get? There is a hospital scene where Michael wheels his father out because he suspects that he is going to, his father is going to be, the villains are going to take their chance in the hospital. Okay. And the police, they are all uh, aligned with the rival gangs. So, there is no uh, uh, protection at the hospital. And he, you know, nurse, you got to help me, you have to, that is my dad. Right after that scene, there is uh, a scene where a policeman attacks Michael and breaks his nose. Yeah. Then later in our discussion with the family, he voices his uh, desire for revenge. And Sunny laughs and says, uh, "This life is not for you." He yeah. says, "You need to get close enough to feel the brains on your uh, suit." Hmm. And then later on, Sunny gets blood all over him, and people show him dead. Yeah. Connection. Anyone here? The wedding of uh, Michael, and when it's con contrast against the first wedding we see, it's very simple and it's so it's more involved with people. Uh, not on the business level, but at more per personal level. Okay. And also uh, <coughs> notice the intercutting between the lights and shades. Okay. Outside it is all sunny, bright and a normal uh, wedding uh, uh, taking place in any regular family. Inside it is all closeted, it is very dark. Okay. So, that is the way Gordon Willis, I have mentioned Gordon Willis is the cinematographer of the movie. Okay. And Coppola and Gordon Willis would have endless quarrels over how to uh, cinematograph, how to photograph the movie, okay. because they could not see eye to eye, but it is one of those collaborations that worked in spite of their differences. And so impressed was Coppola that later he hunted him out for uh, 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 the Godfather second also and Willis said, I do not want to work with you, but then he made him an offer, Willis could not refuse. <laughs> he paid him, you know, unheard amount of some money. So, set pieces or di uh, scenes which are universally acknowledged, the horse's head in bed. And that was a real horse, I mean, do not think it was a dummy. They brought it from uh, uh, meat, uh, you know, uh, makers or butcher's shop, 
and actually plays. So, it was real blood and a real head. Um, wedding scene outside and it, it inter, the way it inter, uh, intercuts with the dark closeted uh, chambers of the godfather while he conducts his business. Pacino shooting a cop in the restaurant, okay, it marks a major, that is the climax of the movie, the first one, you know a total change, a major transformation happening in the, the look at the way he trembles before that, this, that's, he, he, he is an army man, he must have killed several people but not you know the enemy was someone else the other here the enemy is within and he kills a cop that is his first murder. Okay. Pacino wheeling Brando out of the emergency room as you just mentioned. Uh, James Khan, Sonny the hot headed brother gunned down at a check post phenomenal, phenomenal scene wonderfully done and the grand finale the montage. Baptism and intercuts with shooting down of the heads of the rival gangs. And here, montage it may be a homage to Einstein, but still it is not ideologically the same because Einstein, Einstein used montage to depict a certain ideology the powerless, the weak versus the powerful. Therefore, the powerful are at the top of the staircase and the weakest people are. Uh, one is even a, a, a cripple, remember? A maimed guy, okay, uh, just on the crutches um, in Battleship Potemkin. Okay, but here it is a, the montage is more like a bravura editing device, a narrative structure. Okay, and uh, the fight is between equals, so it is not ideological, so that is the way it has been interpreted. Okay, fame and memorable scenes. Pacino and Brando and when Brando realizes that uh, Michael could be his true heir, he realizes that Sonny was one, was his son who was never meant to be, okay, but this is the son who has all the capabilities to carry on the. So, Michael's transformation from a war hero to you know this. So, this is a perfect symmetry while the godfather is being paid homage and when Michael takes over and this is symmetry, this is called a framing device. We begin the movie with respect being shown to the godfather, we end the mo movie with respect same kind of homage being paid to the new godfather and look at the similarity of scene, the way he has shot it. Okay. Fame, other reasons for you know one we were, we have been talking about the reasons uh, uh, claim to fame um, uh, when uh, the movie was being shot or pre-production before it was shot. But once the movie was shot, okay, and the once the movie became such a success, then the myths and legends that developed around it, and one was how Brando got that look. So very often it said that. Brando stuffed his cheeks with cotton balls, not really. He stuck raisin blobs to the back to his back teeth, and that's how he got that bloated look. You know that thick, heavy set jaw look. Um, the baby that is baptized is Sophie Coppola, the great director of Lost in Translation. Okay, uh, Johnny Fontana, uh, the struggling singer, the character is based on Frank Sinatra okay. and uh, Henry Cohen, Cohen the uh, Columbia president, he was uh, uh, never in favor of casting Frank Sinatra in his epic movie from here to eternity, that is a war movie and Frank Sinatra very badly wanted the part and he had mafia connections and therefore, Henry Cohen the executive was coerced into casting Frank Sinatra and that is something Mario Puzo must because he had his uh, mafia connections as well. Okay. So, that was an inside story, this picture was one of them, screenplay adapted material. So, Mario Puzo and uh, Coppola shared the honors and Brando for the best actor which he famously declined because he professed sympathy 
for the way the native Americans were treated by America and then he sent a fake native American, a fake Indian girl to accept and decline his uh, honor. So, that was a big drama, big tamasha that he created and later he was criticized a lot for that. Any comments? Pacino, remember, was never wanted for this role. Everyone was against him except Coppola, the only guy who believed in Pacino. And now, if you watch the movie, can you believe, can you imagine it without Pacino? Okay, there is no one, I mean, at there was a point when they actually wanted Robert Redford for the role. And you can well imagine what he would have done to the role. So, thank God he turned it down. Pauline Keel called it the best gangster film ever made in this film. So, of course, canonized. Okay. We will continue with the movie, but uh, tomorrow also with the discussion. Let us take a couple of minutes to watch the beginning of the film, just to refresh. Now, why do we like this scene so much? And why do we begin the movie with this? Brando's hand, imperial majestic and his enormous head. <laughs> why, why should we begin the movie this way? I believe in America, famous lines. Why, what is so great about the American dream? Anyone can make it big in America, that is the idea. Okay. I am an Italian American, I believe, but I believe in the American dream, American code of justice and equality and law, justice for all. Okay. That is uh, one of its uh, legal tenets, okay. justice for all. But here, did he get the justice? No. His daughter's tragic story and why does he come to the godfather? Here you will find justice no matter what. Okay. So, that is what makes him such an important person and respect and honor. So, from the beginning we are told respect and honor are the key and key words here and they run throughout the film. Okay, loyalty, respect, honor okay. and therefore, it makes it such an important canon. We will continue with the discussion tomorrow. Thank you so much.